have been in this series called Imagine the Fully Devoted Life. And that's what we're doing. We're imagining what our life would be like if we were just like Jesus. And what we could do in our world, how different it would be if we were out there doing what he did as he walked this earth. And if we had the same heart that Jesus had. And we can even imagine what our personal lives would be if we were like Jesus because nothing would overcome us, nothing would overwhelm us. We would be people who had joy in all things. And I think that sounds like a pretty awesome life. What about you? And that's what we should be after. So it all starts with our imagination and thinking about, man, how life would be so different if that's who we are. For us to make any changes, we have to want that to happen. It's got to be beyond something that we just think about. It's got to be something that becomes our dream. It becomes something that uh, is something that we really want to grasp and attain in our life. So that's the question for us. Is it something that we really want? And if it is, it will cause us to begin growing in who we are and learning how it is to be that very thing. And we'll know it's happening because it will be revealed through how it is that we live. Today I want to talk with you uh, even more about how we become this person. Because we've learned that the fully devoted life uh, has different parts to it. One is... And being like Jesus, he shared the love of God with people around him. He talked openly about God and who he was and how God is a forgiving, compassionate God. And we're to be the same people. We are to let people know what God has done in our own personal lives and to share our stories with other people. We also learned that we are to grow in an intimate relationship with God. What we talked about and what we heard about was that a relationship with God is not just to be a one-time-a-week thing. It's supposed to be an everyday thing. In fact, we heard it this way. It'd be kind of like being married, right, uh, when you're with someone else and say, hey, let's get together on Sunday and uh, I'll see you next week. I'll see you next Sunday. That you don't spend any time with that person the entire week until the next Sunday. And obviously that sounds absolutely ridiculous. Some of you are saying, that would be a blessing. Okay, please don't feel that way, all right? Please don't. Hopefully nobody feels that way. Hopefully none of us do. But we should be people who want to be with those people every day. And not that the way it should be with God? And when we feel about him in that way, it will cause us to change our behavior. So that was the second thing that we learned about. And now we're into this whole part of... Of what difference do we make? Because Jesus went around serving other people. He helped people who were in need in a lot of different you know, occasions and in a lot of different ways. And we're supposed to do the exact same thing. So if we're fully devoted, we're doing that. Which leads us to learn today about this topic. We're learning about the work. The work that we do. And the goal, the imagined goal for us today is to live a life that engages the community. So just as Jesus was in the community and he was serving, we're to do the same thing. How do we do this? Well, there are different, there are different elements of our life that lead us to be that. First of all, we have to grow. And what we need to grow in is in a knowledge of who God created us to be. I mean, this is growth in me learning about how God created me and how he gave me certain abilities to do what I do. The second part of it is this, it's preparation, that I need to be prepared to serve people around me. And this preparation part is a spiritual thing that I'm talking about. It's character traits that we are to have in our life if we're going to serve. Because if we don't have these character traits, we won't serve. And then the last part of it is the action, the action that we perform as we become the body of Christ, as we are the hands and the feet of Jesus and begin to meet needs. So those are the three things that we're going to learn about today. And to teach it, we're going to look at some scripture that Paul wrote to a church in a place called Ephesus. So if you'll follow along with me, I want to read to you Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. 
But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. I want to skip to verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets, some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Basically, that statement tells us this, that we become fully devoted followers of Christ, that we're mature in Him, and in all things we live for Him. Well, today, I do want to share with you about this growth and about this preparation and about this action, and we'll begin with the growth part, and I want to do it by talking to you about a certain type of life. We need to grow in learning that we are to live this type of life. And I want to call it a worthy life. So we are to live the worthy life. Now, the word worthy obviously has the word worth in it. And I want you to look at that word in two different right ways. First of all, just the word worth. The word worth means this, that I am of value and of worth. And therefore, people, because of my worth, should help me because of who I am. In other words, all of us are people. We are valuable. We we are people who God created. And all of us, all of us need the help of other people. And you would think if we all see each other that way of worth, that all of us would help each other. So we're all of worth. Then I want you to think about the word worthy. The word worthy is to live a life Of worth. So I'm of worth, so therefore people serve me because I'm valuable, all right? I am worthy when I become a person of worth. In other words, I do something significant with my life. I do something worthy with my life. I'll give you an example of it in this way. I want you to imagine that you're in a house and it's burning and one of the beams falls down. It's on top of you. You can't escape and somebody's walking by down the street. They see the house on fire. They run inside. They see you in that condition. They pull that beam off of you and start dragging you to safety and you're able to stumble out of the house. But while you're stumbling out of the house, another beam falls down on top of the person who just was rescuing you. They eventually can get this person out of the house and you're just barely breathing. And it's obviously that this person who rescued you is about to die. And you go up to this person and you thank him for what he did. And this person says to you, make sure you make something of your life. Don't let this be a waste. That's a pretty heavy statement to have heard, right? Make sure you make something of your life. Don't let this be a waste. Don't let what be a waste? The sacrifice of giving a life for someone else. Isn't that exactly the way it is with us and Jesus? Jesus rescued us because all of us are dying because of the sin in our life, which separates us from God for eternity, kind of like a fire. There's a place called hell. Y'all have heard of that before, right? Yet we have Jesus who came and rescued us so that we can live. But in rescuing us, he gave his life for it to happen. And it's as if Jesus came to us and said these same words. Make sure you make something of your life. Make sure you make something of your life. Don't let what I did be a waste. Well, that's a really, it is a heavy statement and heavy questions, but we need to look at our life and say, well, I know I'm of worth. I know Jesus gave his life for me, but... Am I making a waste of what he did for me? Now we see how important it is to live a worthy type of life. And all of us should do it. In fact, God did create us for that. And in creating us, he chose us to work for him. On your outline sheet, I want you to fill this in. We are chosen. We are capable to fulfill our roles. He not only, uh, we not only know that we do have this value, but we do have ability. The word capable has the word able in it. We are all gifted and have certain ways in which we can help other people. 
I want you to imagine this kind of like a, a draft, an NFL draft. NFL drafts are really big, fat, hairy deals. That Southern Four, a big deal, all right? It's a really big, fat, hairy deal. There are millions of people who watch this all around the, the country and probably all around the world. And the NFL draft, basically, uh, the commissioner comes out and says, this person's on the clock. And they come out, and then they say, this is my draft pick. It's my number one draft pick. In other words, this is a person that I think is the best at this position, and this person's going to make a difference on our team. That's who they draft. Some of you, it's like, well, how in the world can we relate to how it feels to be drafted and whether I'm number one or I'm number what or if I'm not you know, chosen at all. I, I'll give you a great example of that. How many of you have ever been on a playground and there were two people who were chosen as captains and you weren't number one? Do I have a witness from anybody out there about that, right? It's like, I'm not number one. Doesn't it feel good when you're the last one picked? I'm so special. Thank you for desiring me to be on your team. Don't you feel that way when they're doing it? I mean, at least I, I've been last before. You know, I mean, it feels that way. Let me tell you something with God. All of us are number one draft picks. Every one of us has value in the kingdom. All of us do. And because of that, we make a difference. Now, here's the other cool thing about the NFL draft. When they draft, they draft different positions. I'm drafting this person to be the quarterback or the defensive back, the cornerback or the defensive line or whatever it is. And that's the way it is for us. We're the number one draft picks, but he's drafted us to be in a certain position. He's drafted us to do a certain thing. And it's really important to do that because here's the deal. If there's nobody in that position, you'll lose the game. If there's nobody there serving in that position, you're going to lose the game. I'll give you an example of that. Just think about a, a football team. I don't know how much everybody knows about football. It's just this, there's a quarterback. The quarterback throws it to receivers, and there's a defensive back person back there who tries to keep the person from catching the football. What if the defensive back wasn't there? You would lose the game. Because they're not there. And that's what happens many times within a church, within a group, a body of believers. We need people to do certain things, but that person's not there. Oh, there are people who are talented who can do it. They're capable to do it, but they don't choose to do it. They're not choosing to, to live a worthy life. So that's the importance for us to look at ourselves, to see who it is that we are so that we live the right type of life. Are we, what are our gifts? We want to help you know what those gifts are. We're doing it in a couple of different ways. Uh, this series that we're going through, there's a book uh, that we've put together for it. It's also called, called Imagine the Fully Devoted Life. Many of you are reading the book. It's, it's, you read the book, it has questions in there, quiet time guides, but it also has some assessments in there. And in this section of the book, there's a spiritual gift assessment. And it asks you to go through it and it'll have some questions. You just rank yourself zero to 10. You add up the answers and all that stuff to help you figure out which one of these are my spiritual gifts. Now, I know not everybody has one of those books. And even if you do have a book, I want to encourage you to take yet another spiritual assessment that hopefully all of you will be able to have access to. It's called Assess Me. That's why on your outline sheet or on your app, we've put gowinnan.com slash assess me. And if you go to that address, it will take you to a page that you can click on the thing where you can have your email and create a password, and it will take you into these assessments. There's actually three. One of them is a personality assessment that, that teaches you, you know, more about who you are personally. One of them is about leadership, the influence that you have in others. But there's another one called Grace Gifts. And the Grace Gifts test is all about your spiritual giftedness. Here's the reason why we want to help you do this. To take away all the excuses. Because many people say, I don't know what my gifts are. All right, take the test. Because then you'll be able to see what those gifts are and then begin to have ideas about how is it that God can use me within ministry on the team if I live up to these gifts. Now, here's the other part about it. If there's not a defensive back person on the field, you're going to lose the game. Here's the other part. If you're on the field as a defensive back, but you stink at it, you're still going to lose the game. And what we need to be is people who are not only on the team, not only serving, but we need to be prepared to serve. Now, what I'm talking about related to this is it's really a spiritual concept. It's a spiritual idea. 
It's that we need to be in the right condition spiritually to be able to make a difference. Because that's what gives us strength and ability. We have to be of the right spiritual character so that when we're doing what we're doing, that it really makes a difference because our heart is right and our heart is on the right things. We need to be really good at what we do. I played football, and again, looking at me, it's no shock to anyone in this room. Uh, I was third string. That was supposed to be funny. Thank you so much for the pity laughs. Uh, it, it's true. I was, I was third string. I've told people this before. I played on the ninth grade team. I was third string that there was no other lower position in high school athletics than me. By the way, my mom washed my pants with something red and I had pink pants. So anyway, I was known not for the right reason. I was third string. Here's a problem. I wasn't very good. <laughs> So I did, however, get on the, the field for three plays the entire year, and I saved a touchdown. You're thinking, man, wow. I mean, the other two people, first of all, must have got hurt for you to be in. And uh, the answer to that is no. We were winning 40-something to nothing, and then they trusted me. Okay, so they put me in there, and I saved the touchdown. All right? Here's the deal, though. I really wasn't good enough to be first string. I, I really was. I wasn't big enough or whatever. I wasn't made for that position. I really wasn't. And what happens, though, with some people, they are made for that position, but they haven't done things, physically developed themselves in such a way where they can do what they're supposed to do and to have the strength that they need to be able to perform well on the field. So what are those characteristics of character that we're to have? Look at number two on your outline sheet. We're to live the complete life. The complete life. In other words, I am completely to have these things as a part of who I am. Let's look uh, at the scripture again. It says this in verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So this describes what a complete life is. These are character traits that I'm to have. The first is this. I am to be completely humble. So on your sheet, fill it in. I am to live with a humble attitude. Again, we're to be like Jesus if we're fully devoted. This is what it says in Philippians chapter 2 as Paul wrote this letter to that church. He said, Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude, talking about attitude, should be the same of that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, here it is, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. There's some key things about this. Humility is an attitude. Something else about this is that humility says, I'm not trying to be on the same level as you and measure my life according to who you are. He said, uh, the scripture said this, that he didn't see being on the same level of God as be something to attain. That's what the scripture just said. And here's the other part of it. In humility, we put other people before ourselves. Because he said this, he humbled himself to become a man and he gave himself on the cross. In other words, other people became more valuable than himself and therefore he sacrificed for their good. Say all that to help you understand if we're humble or not. Here's how we know. If we sacrifice for others, we're humble. If we don't, we're not. That's what humility is. If I choose not to sacrifice for somebody who's in need, why am I I'm not sacrificing for them? What, what's the reason for that? Whatever reason it is, is somehow I am... Uh, I'm being affected in a way that I don't want to be affected. It's taking me, it's taking some time that I don't want to give. It's keeping me from doing this. It's keeping me from doing that. All of those things are elements of pride. And what we hear from the scripture about Jesus is humility is sacrifice. That's what it is. So if I'm going to be a servant, I have to have the character of humility. I have to be willing to sacrifice for other people. I have to be able to do that to be able to serve. It's a spiritual concept. Here's another spiritual concept you talked about. We are to be gentle. I'm to act gently. 
In other words, I'm not to be harsh. I'm not to say bad things about other people. I'm not to do hurtful things to other people. I'm not to do that. I'm to treat them in a kind way. I don't want to re-preach the message last week, but this connects to what I said last week. We talked about mankind and the meaning of the word mankind. The general meaning of the word mankind is this. We are of the same kind, man. We're all the same kind, okay? We're man. We're humans. But what I encourage you to think about it, uh, do is think about it in a different way. Not only are we of the same kind, man, we need to think of mankind this way. I need to be kind to all man. So when I hear that phrase, mankind, I need to think of that, all right? I'm part of mankind. We're all the same kind. And I'm supposed to be kind to all men. That's really what God created us to do. I mean, it's simply that's it. There's a problem that happens when we're not. As I shared with you, we have, we have issues with segregation. And we segregate each other in many different ways. Segregation really means this. It's to separate us from each other. And we separate us because of uh, skin color or because of economy, how much money we have or our abilities or political preferences or whatever it is. We segment, segment each other and we identify with these different groups of people. Now, this is the question that we have to see. As a person of this group, am I kind to the people in this group? As a person who, and again, I talked about politics last week, and I, I want to share that as an example again today because it's just so, we just see it around us all the time. As a part of this political party, am I saying kind things to people of the other political party? Oh, my soul. You mean you can do that? Am I saying kind things to people of the other political party? Or am I being harsh? Am I saying terrible things about them? And basically, am I trying to make the person feel like they're not good because they have these different beliefs or all of these different things? Am I being kind to each other? Now, here's the, here's the real uh, problem with this. If I am not kind to people of the other political party, I have just lost my ability to serve the people in that party. I can't serve them. Because I'm not kind to them. If I did something for them, they, wouldn't, they would think, what are you trying to get from me? Because you've been unkind. So you have just thrown all of those people out of your ability to serve. All of them. We can look at it in a racial way as well, right? I'm part of this race. And am I kind to the people of the other race? Am I saying terrible things? If we're saying cruel things, if we're doing cruel, we've just eliminated all those people away from our service. And what you do is you put everybody in your own camp, and these are the only people that I'm going to be with and have anything together with. Here's the problem with that. We're to be kind to all men. I don't want something that I say to keep me from having the ability to serve somebody who might be of a different political party or somebody who might be of a different economic position as far as their wealth or somebody who can, is better at something than I am. I don't want to be that person, but you know what? There have been times in my life who I, where I was that person where I've lost my ability to serve them because of something that I may have said that I should never have said. It was cruel. It wasn't gentle. So if we're going to serve, if we're going to be these people, we have to be gentle with everyone. And when people hear what we say or if they are the recipient of what we do, they need to know I matter. I want everybody to turn to the person next to you and say, you matter. Everybody do that right now. It's awesome. It's exactly the truth. And when we feel that way, it will change our behavior. Here's a third thing, all right? It's patience. It's patience. I'm to be patient. It said that in the scripture, the complete life. I'm to be patient. I look up the definition of patient uh, in the dictionary. It said this, teaching kids to drive. That was, uh, actually, it didn't say that. All right, I'm just making that up. Isn't that an example of patience, though? I've had three kids. I mentioned it uh, earlier that we've had, we have four kids, actually. And uh, we have uh, three girls who were born to us. And we have a, a son who is, uh, we adopted early on. And man, what, what a great family to be together. I taught, actually, all four of those kids how to drive. The first 
there was irritation. The second, there was still irritation. Okay, so it just, eventually though, it got better and better as I went through it. That's what happens. What, uh, what uh, we do is we expect, y'all have heard this before, we expect people to do what they do in our timing to keep up with us. But that's not how it all works. Jennifer and I, uh, we, we live downtown, Bradenton actually, and there are a lot of people who hang out downtown who are homeless. And there are some shelter type places down in that vicinity and area. And we see people like that all the time. We're walking you know, down the, the walk or whatever it is. And we've had many conversations with each other about how do you fix homelessness? Y'all, isn't it, it's a burden to me when I think about this. Like, this is one of the biggest problems we have in our country. How do we fix homelessness? And what I've heard people say many times, it's like, well, they're homeless because they're, you know, they're not taking personal responsibility. They don't make any effort. They don't this. They don't that. And maybe some of that is true in some occasions. I, I don't know. We, you know, they need to learn how to get a job. They need to do this. They need to do that. And many times we have that attitude about them. And it might be there's a potential for them to be able to do that eventually. But the problem is we want them to do it now and to fix their problems now so they're not homeless anymore. Well, I will say this. It's hard to get somebody who's struggling, not having a job, and not functioning if they're schizophrenic. If they're bipolar, if they have depression issues, if they've had anxiety issues, if they have abandonment issues, if they have all these things. Oh, there are people out there. There's a reason why they're on the street. They have needs that need to be met, and we need to be patient with those people as we meet those needs and not expect them to live on our timeline. It's when we become patient that we can bring change in our world. I'm actually going to stop right there today, okay? I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and I want to ask you if you are living a worthy life. We have established that all of us are of worth. Every person is of worth. God created us. We're valuable. He created us as capable people to be able to make a difference in our world. But are you living a worthy life? If Jesus came to you and said, uh, make the most of your life, don't let this be a waste. Don't let this sacrifice be a waste. Would you say that Man, I'm not letting it be a waste. I'm out there serving, and many of the people in this room I know would be able to say, I, I, I really am engaged. And y'all, we don't do it for pride. We do it in humility just because we want people to see the love of God through us. That's, that's why we do it. It's not for attention or anything else. It's to do that. But there are other people in this room today who might say, you know what? I really am not. I know I should be. And what I want to encourage you to do today is to take action to do something about it. First of all, hopefully the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart right now to help you sense a burden of who you should be as a fully devoted follower of Christ. Hopefully you have that, and we know that he was a servant. We know that. But I hope that you'll make the commitment today to discover what your spiritual gifts are, to figure out who you are created in Christ and what you're capable to do and to begin to take action and move toward engaging and investing your life in other people. What I know God will do is through His Spirit, He will help you begin seeing people around you in need that you can help. I'll just tell you, the church is losing I would say this, I might be a big statement, but I would say probably every organized church, well, not every, that, that might not be true. Most organized churches are probably losing because not every person who we would say are ministry partners are partnering in ministry. There are holes, and we're losing because Satan's attacking us in those areas where we should be winning. You say, well, we're accomplishing so much, but what could we accomplish if we had more people involved? We lose when we don't reach as many people as we could with the good news of Christ. That's a loss. Just think about what would happen if we would be a part. I don't know what God's created you to be, but I want to ask you today to make the commitment to live a worthy life. 
So as I pray, I encourage you to do the same. Father, I thank you so much for teaching us today. God, I pray that none of us would alienate ourselves away from groups of people because we're unkind or we're not gentle, that we become harsh and we've said things that we shouldn't say. God, I pray that we would be kind to all men, no matter how much money they have, what their abilities are, or what their ethnicity is, God. Again, political environment. God, I just pray that everybody would be on the table for us to be able to serve because we've been kind to all. And I pray, God, that if we haven't, I pray that you convict us right now about our attitudes and who we should be, God, and humility, being a person that we would make sacrifices for who are completely on the opposite side of who we are, knowing that you love them as well. God, I pray that you would call us to our place of service. And God, if there are areas where we haven't been living a worthy life, I pray that we would begin. And I pray that it would start today. Help us to make the commitment to take action, to move, to do something great for you. God, help that place on the team where there's a hole. God, help me. Help me fill it. Pray, God, that you would help us honor you in all that we do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.